because we are in Revelation chapter 11 as we continue on in our study of this amazing and challenging book. How many of you think Revelation is a hard book? Yeah, I do. I, I, man, I do. But it's a good book. It's a good book. I'm going to read you the last section starting in verse 15. Revelation chapter 11 starting in verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And that you should reward your servant, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, great and small, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple, and there were lightning, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Wow. Father, thank you for your word and that you brought us to this place on Thanksgiving week. Father, we need uh, your help. We need the help of your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to the message you have for us today. And I, Lord, I know you've got one for each person here. Each person. Now, Holy Spirit, speak to them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the things I do as I, as I read through my Bible is I I ask questions of the scriptures that I'm in. Then the first question I always ask is, what does this section of scripture tell me about God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's a good place to start, isn't it? Because see, the Bible is the revelation of God. The Bible is God revealing himself to you. So a good question to ask is, what does this scripture telling me about God. The second question I ask is, what is this section of scripture telling me about myself? One of the great things about the Bible is that it tells us the truth about ourselves. The truth about who we were before we were in Christ and who we are after in Christ. And I want to grow in my knowledge of who I am because who I am in Christ is such an amazing thing. I, I want to learn more about this. So let's take a look at this section in light of those questions. And don't forget where we are here. The sixth trumpet of God's judgment has, has blown in that horrible 200 million man army. Folks, can you imagine that? A 200 million man army has been released upon this earth. Now as bad as that was, John writes down this ominous warning. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe coming quickly. And with that, the seventh trumpet blew. And notice where the view shifts to. Do you see that? It shifts from earth back into heaven, where voices, loud voices, proclaim the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Folks, this is one of the great verses in the book of Revelation. If you write in your Bible, you should star this verse. You should underline it. You should highlight it. This is an important verse. You see, since Adam and Eve fell to the devil's temptation in the Garden of Eden, the kingdoms of this world have belonged to who? To Satan. Yeah. The Bible is very clear that the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, is none other than Lucifer, Satan himself. The kingdoms of this world were given to Adam and Eve they forfeited them through sin into the hand of Satan. Now, this is a very important question. When did God and his Christ earn the right to take back the kingdoms of the world from the enemy? Where did that happen? On Calvary's cross. 
Remember that Jesus not only redeemed the souls of men and women on the cross, he also redeemed the earth and all of creation. When Jesus ascended down into Sheol and took the keys to death and Hades away from Satan, he served notice that his time of rule on planet earth was about to end. This declaration here from heaven is that Satan's time is up. His judgment is about to begin to prepare the earth for the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, which is now just three and a half years away at this point in the tribulation. Remember, part of the purpose of the tribulation is to prepare the earth for the rule of Jesus Christ. That process is now fully engaged. Now, this is good news for the redeemed, isn't it? But it's not good news for the people who dwell upon the earth. Now, the exciting part of all this is that it reminds us once again that Jesus Christ is coming back bodily to this earth. In his first advent, he came as a babe, wrapped in swathing clothes, lying in a manger. At his second advent, his second coming, he will come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It says his feet will, will, actually, will actually touch down on the Mount of Olives. He will walk through the Valley of Kidron. He will bless through that eastern gate, and he will set up his rule and reign in Jerusalem. And from there, he will rule, they tell us here, forever and ever. Jeremiah tells us when that takes place, that righteousness will cover the earth like a flood. Isn't that good? And that the peace and the joy of the Lord will rule the earth. And guess what, saints? You're going to be ruling right there with him. Does that blow your mind? It should blow your mind. It should. And notice the unity of all this. The kingdoms of this world. Folks, there's lots of kingdoms in this world, aren't there? Lots of kingdoms. Fighting each other. Battling for space. Lots of kingdoms. Well, they will all be brought together. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom singular of our Lord. This world will be one perfect kingdom united under the reign of Jesus Christ. And folks, I don't know about you, but I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm so sick of man's rule on this earth. So sick of it. I can't wait until he rules and reigns on this planet. Now, the 24 elders hear this, and they, as you can imagine, get really excited. And they add a little commentary to this. Listen to this, verse 16. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servant, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. You know, one of the things I love about the book of Revelation is that in it we, we get to see the most common response of heaven to just about everything. And that, of course, is to, to worship to worship God. We see this over and over, time and time again. A declaration is made, what happens? Heaven worships. A big event happens, what happens? Heaven worships. Shouldn't our first response to anything that happens be exactly the same? I mean, think about this. What if your first response to anything that happened to you in your life was to worship God, not get angry, not challenge or doubt, not grumble or complain, not throw in the towel, but you just stopped and you worshiped God, knowing that God is in absolute control and that our God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Folks, that's a great principle that would produce tremendous fruit in my life and in your life as well. Now, not only do the 24 elders worship God, they also give him thanks. And notice what they're thankful for. Do you see it? We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come. And one of the most powerful aspects of God is that he is the one constant that you can always count on. He's the one who was and is, and is to come. In other words, God has your whole life covered. He's the God of your past. 
He can deal with the junk of your past and the failures of your past and the heartbreak of your past, the missed opportunities of your past. He's got them totally covered in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's the God who is. He's the God of right now. I love this about God. God's time is right now. He calls himself the great what? I am. He's the I am right now. Our God is the God of the present. And in your present, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. In your present, God loves you with an everlasting love. In your present, his grace, mercy, and blessings are brand new. In your presence, God's strength and power is sufficient for all that you will face. In your present, God will give you everything you need for life and godliness. Those aren't off in the future. Those are yours right now. He is the God who is. He's the God of your right now, but it doesn't stop there. He's also the God who is to come. Now, this is obviously talking about the second advent, the second coming of Christ. Notice, that is the context of our passage. But within that is contained this thought. God has your future covered. God says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I know the, I know the plans I have for you. For a future and for a home. You know, here's all you need to know about your future. Jesus has gone ahead to prepare a place for you that where he is, you might be also. And the work he started in you, he's going to finish. In other words, Jesus has prepared a place for you and he's going to make sure you make it there. Folks, that should make you stand up and say hallelujah. Amen. It should. <laughs> now the 24 elders go on. And they say, because you have taken your great power and you have reigned. You know, God can do anything with his great power. But here's God's decision. He has taken his great power, and with it, he will reign upon the earth. See, God's not forsaken this earth. He has not forsaken it. In fact, it's just the opposite. He's all in. He is all in. Now, his reign will accomplish two things. He will judge, and he will reward. You might want to write that down. In his reign, he accomplishes two things. He will judge and he will reward. First, he's going to judge. Look at verse 18. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time of the dead that they should be judged and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Saints, this is the part of God's reign that a lot of people just don't like. See, they, they want God to be a God of love and mercy, of grace, a God of salvation. And he is. You know he is. But he's also a God of justice and of truth. The unrepentant sinner is going to get what they deserve. That, that's justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. And God knows the truth about what people deserve. And in many cases, we know in our hearts, that's exactly the way it should be. Look at where this starts. The nations were angry. And your wrath has come. Those who destroy the earth will be destroyed. Now, obviously, this is a reference to what's happening during the tribulation at this particular time. Remember, the inhabitants of the earth have shaken their fists at God. They don't want God involved in their lives. They don't want God involved in their, in their world. And when God tries to come in, when God tries to get involved, they get angry. They get mad. And now, you have this great declaration from heaven. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God. That makes it even worse. God is now taking back the world and people are angry. I like what, I like what Newell said here. He said, religion is decent, but surrender to God is intolerable for the nations of this world. Oh, how true that is. They can tolerate a little religion. But when God says, I want you to surrender your kingdoms to me, it's a no deal. Well, we're going to see how this wrath pays out, because you have to get this, folks. The response of God to anger and hatred and destruction is wrath. When men stand back and defy God's law, 
and they shake their fists in anger at God, they will be the recipients of God's wrath. And we're going to see how this plays out as we go through the rest of the book of Revelation. Look at the next part of this. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. If there's one thing the Bible is very clear on, it's very clear. There is coming a day of judgment. It's going to come. Men and women will reap what they have sown. If they've sown to their own flesh, they will reap the destruction thereof. See, this, folks, this is the justice of God. Not more, not less. They reap what they sow. And, and there's a part of this that, that we get, don't we? We know that there are people that so deserve the justice of God. In fact, we can't wait to see it. You know those ISIS jihadists that cut off the heads of those Christians? You see, you see them? You see what they just did in Paris? You know, I, I can't wait for those guys to stand before the throne of God. Boko Haram, what they're doing to women and children in Africa. I can't wait for those guys to stand before the throne of God. The perpetrators of mass destruction down through the ages. I mean, who among us doesn't think that Hitler, Pol Pot, Stalin shouldn't stand before the God of the universe? And folks, it will happen. It will happen. God has said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. It's going to happen. He will extract vengeance on behalf of the innocents down through the ages. And, and to that, we, we will we'll say, yeah, okay, we get that. But see, the average person, apart from Christ, thinks they're in a whole different category than this. And yet, here's the reality. Apart from Christ and his salvation, the wages of sin is what? Death. It's death. It is. Physical, spiritual death. Folks, Judgment is coming. It's coming. And you don't want to have any part in it. You don't want, no, here's the part you want to be in. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great. See, th this is what you want to be a part of. You want to be part of the rewards that are given to the servants of God. Those who fear his name, both small and great. Now, what are those rewards? What, what rewards come to the believer? Well, let me give you a little idea of what awaits us as believers. The Bible talks about crowns that we will receive when we get to heaven. For example, you have the crown of rejoicing. This is the joy that we have in heaven over those that we've impacted for the kingdom of God. But then beyond that, in God's presence, there is fullness of what? Joy. There's fullness of joy. See, one of our rewards is, is going to be the joy of the Lord in abundance. And then you have the crown of righteousness. This is the righteousness that is ours in Christ that will be a visible reality in heaven. See, we know that the righteousness of Christ has been imputed. It's been deposited into the account of our lives. But in heaven, we're going to be living and enjoying the fullness of that righteousness. Then you have the crown of glory. Glory is the visible expression of the nature and the splendor of God. That's God's glory. And folks, I don't even know how this is going to work. But some of that glory is going to be imparted to you. We're going to be sharing in God's glory. Folks, that's going to be awesome. And then you have the crown of life, which Jesus himself promised us. Folks, this is eternal life. This is abundant life. This is the life of God flowing in us. We have no idea how wonderful that's going to be. Remember this. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life. And that more abundantly. That abundant life starts now. But the fullness of it is going to be ours in heaven. So as part of our rewards, we get joy, we get righteousness, we get glory, we get life. And do I have to tell you, you can't buy those things. You can't earn those things. You'll never deserve those things. You, 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 you can't just, just kind of make them come up in your life. No, they're an absolute gift from God. That's part of our rewards. But now, I know what some of you are thinking because you're practical. You're thinking, well, Pastor, those are all great, but... Do we get any stuff? Do, can we, do we get some stuff as part of our, some stuff? Well, you know this for sure. Jesus has prepared a dwelling place for you. And folks, I, I gotta tell you, 
The place that Jesus prepared for you is marvelous. It's marvelous. But then beyond that, we've become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything the Father gives to Jesus, we're going to share in. You'll have more amazing stuff in heaven than you could ever imagine. Paul said this, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it even entered the heart of man. What God has prepared for those who love him. The rewards that await those who fear his name in heaven are out of this world. So, how do you avoid the judgment? And how do you become eligible for those rewards? That's the question, isn't it? How do you avoid that judgment? And how do you become eligible for those rewards? It's, it's so simple. But I'm going to tell you what, it, what, it, what it's not. It's not joining the church. It's not becoming religious. It's not becoming a, a, a Bible thumper. <laughs> no, it, it's as simple as coming into a personal, living relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And in that process, you are born again spiritually from above. You become a new creation Old things passed away. All things become new. By the power of the Spirit of God, you become a follower of Jesus Christ. That's how it happens. And if, you, if that interests you, if that's on your heart today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer this morning, right now, that allows you to do just that, to open your heart up to Jesus Christ living in you. So let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you for this amazing portion of scripture, just a few verses, but Lord, it contains so much and we didn't even scratch the surface. And Lord, here's the reality. The voices from heaven proclaim the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will rule forever and ever. Wow. That's where we're headed. That's what's gonna happen. The kingdom of man is going to fold and your kingdom's going to come. And in that kingdom, there's two things. There's judgments and there's rewards. And I, I remember when I was uh, a prime candidate for that judgment. Lord, if there, if there was one thing I knew as a non-believer here, this was it. I was one day going to stand before you and give account of my life as only you knew it. And Lord, I did not want that to happen. So thankful that you provide a way out for me and a way out for all of us here this morning. And that is through the death of your son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross, where he bore my sin and yours in his own body, that today he might stand and offer you forgiveness and salvation. And right now, I believe this morning, Jesus is knocking on the doors of your hearts. And some of you, you know, you've been in church for a long time. You've been coming to Kumlani Chapel. You're, you've been checking it out. You know, and, and you like what you see. But you still know you've never made that personal commitment to Jesus Christ. You've never opened up your heart and let Jesus come in. You've never surrendered your kingdom, the kingdom of your life, to him. And you know, it's one thing to be religious and come to church, but that's not what's going to save you. It's that surrender of your life today to Jesus Christ. And some of you, God has called you today to this place for this very purpose. It's a divine appointment. You know it. We couldn't have planned it. God planned it. He planned it for you because he loves you. He wants to save you from the wrath to come. He called you here today because Jesus wants to come in and live in you and be your Lord and be your Savior. He wants you to be a recipient of his rewards, his love, his joy, his righteousness, and his glory. And if that's your need today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now of inviting Jesus Christ to come into your life. So if that's your need, you pray with me right now. You can pray this out loud. You can pray it in your heart. God sees your heart. But you follow me. Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I have sinned. I've fallen short of the person you wanted me to be. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I receive that right now. 
Jesus, I open my heart up to you. I ask you to come in. Live in me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my God. Be my friend. I surrender my life to you. Holy Spirit, come and live in me. Cause me to be born again today that I might have power to follow Jesus. If you prayed that prayer this morning, now I want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up and say, Ricky, I prayed that prayer. Did you, you pray it? And you pray, did you pray it back there? Awesome. And you prayed it right back there? Me. Anyone else? You, you, the, right? Two people in the back right there. You prayed that prayer. You're born again. You're going to heaven. Anyone else? You prayed that prayer. You, did you pray it today? Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? God brought you here for this day. You're going to heaven. Wow. <laughs> Anyone else here today? You prayed that prayer this morning. Did you, you pray it this morning? Really? Praise God. You know, he's living right inside of you. He's living in your heart. You're going to heaven. Wow. Anyone else? You prayed that prayer this morning. You prayed. Way in the back. You prayed it? Wow. Hallelujah. You're going to heaven. You're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new for you right now. Anyone else? You prayed that prayer this morning. Anyone else? Salvation's here, folks. It's here. Salvation's here. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Father, thank you for these that have made that commitment to you, and now I pray that you just give them the courage, Lord, to make that public proclamation. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm, I'm a follower of Christ. Lord, surround them with believers. Um, God, open their hearts up to your word. Lead them. Guide them in ways that blow their mind. Let them sense your peace. Let them sense your forgiveness. Let them know your grace. Let them know that the righteousness of Christ has been imparted to them. Father, I thank you that the angels in heaven are rejoicing right now. They are so stoked. So we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name.